My experience when one attends a talk, an exhibition or a demonstration, there's usually one new thing you pick up and can come in useful later on. Um, I do have, know that fellow members build ships of the sailing era on open boats. I do admire the skill and craftsmanship put into these. These are beautifully finished and I'd like to know how they're actually finished because it shows up all the natural wood which they expose, uh, particularly in the hulls, etc. Uh, this subject uh, for this talk will be illustrated by my own models, all scratch built, but um, 20th century naval vessels. And when I refer to the war, I do mean World War II, 39 to 45. So let's move on, next slide. Right now, uh, these are the various scales of small ships that I've made. Um, 92 is a 16th of an inch to the foot. Um, 1384 is 32nd of an inch to the foot. 1200 is a quarter of a millimetre to the foot and uh, half that for the 2400. The society's definition of miniature is 1384 and smaller. I've included one or two slightly larger scales, but they're all glass case and fairly small models, so I've allowed myself to include those. I have um, uh, working models at 196, 1 8 an inch to the foot, uh, which uh, I will occasionally refer to during this talk to illustrate certain points, but otherwise I'll mostly concentrate on these smaller scales uh, in front of you now. Uh, these are some of the samples of materials I use. Um, at the top we've got ordinary wire, which is basically from electrical flex, and it's very useful if it is tinned, so it gives that silver look, particularly if you're using it for rigging or um, railings uh, uh, around the side of the ship. Um, the next one down is uh, a brass uh, rod, and then next an aluminium tubing. You get the all in various sizes and there's some beautifully made aluminium tubings and brass ones as well uh, which are slide fit into each other from ranging from about 0.3 uh, millimeter diameter right up to uh, one millimeter or, or one and a half millimeter and they are like telescoped into each other. Um, I think they're British made I'm not sure but you can certainly avail them in the UK. The next two little bits are the aluminium shim on the left and copper on the right. Uh, the shim comes from the printer's litho plate, and I've got it in 0.15 millimeter or 0.3 uh, thicknesses. It's much easier to manipulate than the copper, and I've only come across the aluminium one more, more recently, particularly on small scales. Uh, the white sheet is plastic card, which comes in various thou thicknesses, uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, etc. Um, very useful. And also wood. Now I use wood. I have other woods such as balsa and obeki. And obeki I've had in the attic for about 30-40 years and that's well matured. But I've more recently come across bass wood. Now that's what it's known as in the USA but it's known as in Europe lime wood. I have looked it up. It is actually the same or similar species but there's slight differences in my experience between the lime you get in, in the UK and the bass uh, from the USA. Bass is much finer, firmer, smaller grained and is beautifully uh, cuttable and carvable. Unfortunately we can only get it in two foot lengths over here from a company called Midwest um, which is not very good for uh, working models at four or five feet long. Yeah. Um, now the wood is obviously got grain and pores in it so you need to close these up if you're going to paint these things and <clears throat> sanding seal, I tell you the sanding seal is ideal for this. It uh, can be applied quite easily, um, sets very, dries very quickly, can be sanded down and rubbed down and several other coats until you're satisfied there's a smooth enough finish. Um, it does produce quite an odour so uh, you need ventilation, uh, it's rather like dope in fact. Paints, as my models are all painted, of course they're metal construction warships are, so it's all painted. And we use the Humbrol tinlets, which I know are available in Europe because I've spoken to European model makers. And though they're made in the UK, they are available there. I 
not sure about US Sail Canada. Um, some of the uh, colours uh, come in a spray, as you can see the big cow at the back, and I use particularly as a medium or light grey and a dark grey for hulls and decks as well. Otherwise, I paint directly with tinlets uh, from the small ones you see in the front. Um, when I'm putting a first coat on, very often I cover with a white or a grey um, acrylic primer, which is something you get from the car repair shop. And uh, that uh, produces uh, a nice thin coat, a suitable colour to paint over, and also um, it shows up any slight defects there may be in the finish of your wood hull before you uh, begin to paint it. So for any defects you can rectify it. So it's called a rectification coat. Now, um, as it takes say three, six years to build a model, um, I was advised once several years ago to buy lots of tin bits of the colours you particularly wanted, uh, just in case there may be different batches later on, a year or two later, uh, which may vary in colour. I haven't found that to be the case in Humbrol tinlets and um, so I've managed to buy some later on and the colour seems very consistent with the what I put on two or three four years before. Uh, the consistency has varied over the years. Uh, the Eurasia ones used to have quite a consistency of pigment in them which used to drop to the bottom and you had to stir the thing once you'd opened it for a painting very thoroughly indeed. Uh, covering pads is usually pretty good with these ones. Uh, there are other makes uh, in the UK which weren't quite so good, so I've stuck back with the um, Humbrol enamels. Um, more recently I've noticed that they are more fixotropic, so you don't have to stir quite as much. It's more, there doesn't seem to be any settling at all. Uh, one other point someone pointed out to me is, do I use a spray gun? Uh, and apart from the spray cans that you can purchase if you can get the right colour. Um, I don't use a spray gun. I'm not a gadgets person. But I do find loading the spray gun up, spraying it and then cleaning it all out and setting it up ready for next time adds so much time and trouble I just simply don't bother. So I use uh, everything is brushed otherwise. These are some uh, working brushes. You can see they're working ones but the state of them in. So on the left here is a wider flat brush and a slightly narrow one next to the long, there for large areas like hulls, etc. The middle brush here is um, for general uh, small work and uh, a much more tiny one for almost like uh, lines or spotting. This little chap at the end used to look like that but the bristles over a period of time being washed with white spirit to clean them off, clean the enamel off, they eventually disintegrated. So it's left it like a little tiny, tiny mop. Now the use for that brush is if, for instance, you have a dark gray steel deck and you've got a light gray or a white um, item coming from the deck. And if you've got a little bit of blue or something that's not right, not, it's shiny compared with the matte finish like for warships, then you can just get a little bit of paint on that, slide it along like a mop, like you would mopping on a floor, and then just touch up the the uh, the glue uh, on around the uh, vertical piece on the deck, so you just touch it. If you use a longer narrow brush like that, then there's a risk that will flop when you're touching up a small spot, and it'll inadvertently touch something else you don't want coloured. So that, on occasions, has proved extremely useful. Um, the natural synthetic, um, I've used both sable and synthetic, it doesn't seem to make much difference for this. Um, oh, yes, one other point, many years ago one of the club members uh, in Bromley here in the SMS uh, suggested he uh, used some of these handles from old brushes, turned them right down and made masks and spars out of them for his sail models. Uh, I don't know if that's um, something that's really suitable, but uh, it's not in my experience. Whoops, wrong way. Now, this is just a sample on a bit of plastic card to show you how to delineate lineage. Uh, not <laughs> I'm just showing you how I do it. Uh, here is a, a low-tack masking tape. It's made by Tamiya, a Japanese firm, which make a lot of plastic models. But they also make this exceedingly useful um, 
tape which comes in six or ten or wider millimeter uh, widths. So I put some on there, painted on this dark grey here, removed the half of the yellow low tech tape there, and you can see how fine an edge has been produced. One thing if you're using masking tape, it's obviously thick in the paint that uh, you apply all the layers, and you're supposed to brush away from the, um, from the masking tape to avoid a build-up like a, a little wall that you don't want. Otherwise, if you've got a curve, um, as you see here, the curve one I've just penciled in an outline, and then just by hand work to the outline with the shady colour you may need. You'll find out why I'm doing these various colours uh, shortly. Now, uh, warships as you know them today or in peacetime are usually of grey. And here's one of my working models, four foot long. Um, it's a vintage model now, but it just shows you the sort of grey that we, we use. Um, this is a Royal Navy ship and the grey, I notice, has got a slightly bluer tinge to it than uh, other navies. Uh, whereas I think the US grey is quite a grey grey, if you understand me, rather than any added additives to it. Which, so it seems to my eye. Um, the Royal Navy before World War II had three greys, a dark grey, which is the home fleet, uh, middle grey, and those on the uh, Mediterranean station were a light grey, which is quite light indeed. Um, the Royal Navy survey ships, the hydrographic survey ships, are painted white, so uh, that's, um, that's the colouring for those. I have in this carrying box or you know, travel box for keeping the model uh, protected. Um, I've now discovered that ships badges are more available and here's one for the HMS Falmouth um, here. That's the life size one but it's converted from another one. They do come in diamond shapes or round or U-shaped depending on supposedly on the class of ship but I haven't found it's all that consistent so I've made that up and altered it to Falmouth. Uh, this is a 132nd inch to the foot, so it's nine inches long, a river class frigate. And uh, I can basically show you this is some of the camouflage uh, attempts which were used by the Royal Navy in World War II. And some exotic ones toward the beginning of the, that period of the war were quite, um, quite amazing. This just shows you rather like I showed you on the sample there of the, of the wavy line which seems to be rather unique to this particular ship, HMS Fowl. Uh, and the rest of the, apart from the blue here, the rest of it is uh, white. But I'll come more onto that uh, shortly. The later on in the war, towards the end of the war, and I think this applied to the US as well as our Royal Navy ships, we ended up with a light grey hull and upper works and a block of blue running all the way, but short of the step and stern. Uh, Dazzle, Camouflage, which was somewhat popular in World War I, um, I don't think was used on warships in World War II. Research is essential, of course. You have to understand uh, working from black and white photos, <clears throat> which was relevant at the period, uh, to check the other side of the ship. You so often see a photograph on one side, but is the camouflage pattern the same on the other side, or is it not? That's why it's to check. Warships also can change their appearance quite a lot during their lifetime and gain particularly wartime developments of radar, etc. You have to include this. And uh, a lot of the early, sh early ships, uh, this is again early 1940-ish, oh, this is 43, but you know, the design was 40-ish, have a tripod mast and these were replaced by lattice masts, which were much stronger to carry the weight of all the radars needed later on. This is a colour chart I got from a book by a chap called Wright and it shows British and Commonwealth warship paints during World War II. Now they all have a name and a number and it quite staggers me unbelievably that they can produce so many different colours for so many camouflage schemes which they thought up particularly during wartime when there's always shortages and particularly of pigments and also delivering to the shipyards where the ships can be repainted or uh, refitted or whatever. So I don't know how come red, red is suitable and there's something called a Mountbatten pink in various shades, Mountbatten being one of our famous or 
war leaders. Um, he invented this, uh, I think, to work out in someone like the Indian Ocean was a good camouflage team, according to him. So uh, I thought we'll pass on from that. Now, this one shows the um, various sample camouflage schemes on VNW class destroyers, uh, the various colours and that. Unfortunately, Wright's book only shows the starboard side, so you can't guarantee that that's going to be the same on the port side. That's one of the drawbacks. Most of the ships are painted in light or a darker grey, but the decks are always in quite dark grey, certainly in the Royal Navy. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, ahead of myself. Here we are. Now, this is um, a flower class corvette early in World War II um, in British yards. Some went to the USA and several were made in Canada as well as uh, the UK. It's um, 1384 scale, it's just under six and a half inches long and set in the scene. Now, this is basically white, but you've got green and blue, and I'll explain this if you're happy to listen to me. If you take on a modern sail ship, uh, you see nowadays with glass fiber hulls and metal masts, the masts are often white or very, very pale grey, from what I can see um, for when I go on holiday. And if you set it against, look at it against the sky, which is often a bit greyish in the UK, uh, it uh, melds in very well. You don't see it very easily. So the idea was that in the North Atlantic, where these were escort ships were working, in the North Atlantic, in daytime, um, the, 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 the biggest enemy for these were the U-boats. Now, if you've got a periscope six feet above the water surface, and you look at a ship a, thousand, a couple of thousand yards away, it seemed to be on the horizon, and therefore the hull and the superstructure, or most of the ship above water, will appear to be in front of the background, which is the sky, not the uh, not the sea. So the sky is much lighter than the dark ocean sea in the North Atlantic. And uh, Peter Scott, one of the naturalists who is also a Royal Navy officer, came out with the idea of a white uh, hull to be seen against the light sky by comparison with the dark. Uh, ocean water uh, and pasted on the birds flying in the northern hemispheres and the Arctic which had little green and blue patches on the feathers as well presumably for some form of uh, camouflage for them so they copied this and applied it again in the earlier parts of the war to the scheme you see there. Again, uh, this, these, this is called a Western Approaches, which means convoys coming from Canada and the USA East Coast will come into the West Coast, like Liverpool in, in the UK. And uh, uh, this, is, this is the sort of scheme that was seen at the time. Now, size is important. I'm jumping here to a 196 scale a working model just to illustrate some points. Now, this is a twin four inch uh, mounting, which is high angle, low angle, and that's the mounting of the guns, as you see it there. You can see the detail on it, the rivets and all sorts of the lamps over the uh, breaches, illumination during the dark, uh, the trunnions, uh, this will be for the sighting uh, telescopes etc. And if you add then the shielding uh, you can see that it's uh, 40 millimeters wide 1.6 inches. So a lot of detail you can get in there and including metal work as you can see I'm not a metal worker I've never had any training in it um, but various colors etc as well and uh, all the um, the nuts and bolts holding down the, the flanges onto the deck etc. You can add quite a lot of detail at that scale. Moving on to a much smaller scale, back to the 1384, this, uh, okay, it's a single gun, but the actual casing or shield, that's just four millimeters or so wide. So the beam of the ship is 22 millimeters or seven eighths of an inch at that point. But you can't get that sort of detail on something of this scale. I've managed to include all the shell ready use, uh, shell racks or ready use for firing off and early come gun, etc. Um, and, and a ladder here. 
and I've managed to get some wood on for the um, near the wooded part of the decks, which you don't see so much on modern ships today. As this model is about 42 years old, I'm afraid this uh, hasn't faded to a weathered look, so uh, <laughs> it's resisted my efforts to get it to um, uh, fade. Here is uh, use of that tape again. I mentioned the low-tack tape. It's stuck down, uh, sticky side up, and held down with, at each end. And on little bits, little tiny bits, you can put on here, and they'll just even little wire bits that so will stick onto it, and then you can spray it. This is just a bit of aluminium uh, foil, which is to save uh, a couple of inches of tape, and I can take that off and use that non-effective bit later. And here it is after a bit of spray painting, and you just take the pieces off. It's such low tech, it's, it's absolutely ideal for our, our work in this respect. Moving down the scale a bit more, Bit more, this is one 1200, uh, a Royal Navy post war frigate 1970, and you can see it's 85 millimeters long, which is three and three eighths of an inch. And uh, I'll talk more about it in a minute, but I want you to just look at this area here, which is the mast and radars and various spreaders. So if we just move on to that, I'll concentrate on that particular bit there. And you can see I put it on a wooden block for manufacturing the thing and it's got a very very fine bolt through underneath the block of wood up into the bottom of the uh, mast. The mast used to be uh, a lattice mast but it's been plated in in later years so that is a nice block of basswood cut to shape, rounded edges, tapered and a platform put on top. Now these uh, arms are spreaders and that's for the UHF. I couldn't complete it because the cone shape on there defeated me, but I've added a little bit of wire there. But these are um, spreaders and they've got supports sort of dripping down uh, for the other parts of the radar and, and um, communications. They look a bit thick here, but this top one is 0.12 diameter steel and the bottom one, if it comes back, is 0.1 millimeter diameter and so are these little bits, so about a millimeter high. They look rather thick there, I don't know why because I think the lighting is coming from the other side so it doesn't show it up very well. The mast itself is painted grey but these uh, are, are, are um, white, or they will be white when I've painted them. Uh, the workout at scale to about six inches diameter on the real thing which is probably not far off real. Uh, which is perhaps a little bit of a fluke really. I did a little experiment, I got some brass rod uh, and a 0.24 millimeter diameter, added a coat of spray paint, 0.27, and a coat of enamel paint, uh, painted on 0.29 for the second coat, 0.32. So there we've got an increase of 0 0.08 uh, over the original, which at small scales is quite significant. So you have to be aware wary of how much you're applying, particularly white, which is not a good covering colour and you have to be pretty, apply it pretty thinly and sparingly. Uh, from that same model, 1200 tail is uh, the ship's uh, whaler. You can see it's six, six and a bit in, uh, millimetres long and that is a vacuum, that is formed by pressing on plastic carb through, heated through a mould and a plug. And I've got a bit of teak in there, which is a bit decked. Get the teak in as a railing, there's one thwart there. That's the motor box. And if we move on, you can see the ship again. And there's the wader there. And I've got the rudder and the stem and the keel in as well. These are all the radars, quite complicated, some quite heavy looking. That's the one I was talking about earlier. You can see the spreaders are all white now. And um, there's another little lattice mast there with another radar on top. Uh, this is a search communicator and a twin Bofors 40 millimeter gun there and, and a head throwing weapon which is called a squid in the Royal Navy throwing a, a lobbing a bomb right ahead over the ship to once they found the submerged submarine. Now I put this, this is a V&W class destroyer 1918 uh, I put this in in silhouette to illustrate some of the fineness of the uh, wire you have to use at these small scales. This is a 12, sorry, 
2400 scale model. And it's, it's a full hull one, so it's mounted on these uh, bra brass pedestals. I'll explain more about this at the end of the uh, talk. But basically it's to show you that we have um, the standing rigging, the, um, the stays, and uh, from the gaff there, and funnel, funnel um, stays as well. Uh, but you'll notice that the aerials between the two masts are slightly thicker. These stays in that are 0.01 millimeter diameter, 10 microns, but because they can only straighten in very short lengths, it's such fine wire, you can't do the old rolling technique to get it uh, straightened out, but it's a little bit easier with these at 0.015, so they look a bit heavier, but uh, I couldn't manage to get the finer ones to run that full length there. Uh, one other little thing on this one is that um, between the four funnel and there is a steam pipe in front of it, which is separated from that by 0.1 of a millimetre, which is the same as kitchen foil. I put a bit of kitchen foil in, but the point is you have to paint the funnel and the steam pipe in front of it first. If you didn't paint, if you put them in place first and painted them, you'd lose all the gap, uh, which would be just literally at the front of the funnel there. Now, uh, when I say uh, 10 microns for this wire, just in comparison, out of interest, um, a red blood cell is eight microns diameter. So it gives you some idea of the sizes we can work to if possible. Now, moving on, uh, I'll talk more about that ship model at the end, as I say. This is back to 196 scale, uh, the ship I showed you originally in its box. This is uh, a template to make the pedant number. So I draw it out on a piece of graph paper, glue that down to a bit of card, um, plastic card, and then cut round the tracings to the particular number you wanted. And then what you do then, you have to make two, by the way, one for the stern and one for the sides, which are larger. There it is on the transom. It's quite an old model. It's washed. It's been in the water for 43 years now, on and off. So it's, <laughs> it's got a little bit old looking. But the point is, you've painted it white. And then in the Royal Navy, you decided sometime after World War II, they'd have a white outline to it as well. So you have to then go round on the white, cover it with the black uh, and paint within the... Uh, within the limitations of the outline for. The outline, uh, the original white outline is painted, um, sorry, if I go back, I'll explain that. Once you cut this out, apply it to the side of the hull and keep it in place, make sure it's not tilted, keep it glue, um, taped to the side of the hull. And then I go round uh, inside the lettering onto the painted hull surface with a very, very fine pointed um, point like on the uh, like on a divider that produces a slight groove on the paint surface but also raises a very slight ridge at the side so when you come to paint that on the white first which is complete you know white um, you paint up to that little um, little ridge that's created in the scratch in the paint and that's my guideline to paint it uh, white to get the black on, you then have to use a, a ruler and run with the black uh, pen or pen initially and then bl black it in with paint later inside the edges. These are about two or three inches diameter on the real ship, so it's pretty fine there. If you, the only tricky bit is doing the curve bits here, so it's best to try and choose a number like F11 or 111 or something, which are all straight sided. It does make life a little bit easier. Oh yes, 1200 scale, this, uh, this white would be 0.05 millimetres, so you can't do it on very small scales, or at least I can't. Okay, getting back to the 1200 scale, this is showing you another pennant number and another frigate. Uh, I make a 10 millimetre high master artwork here. Paint the um, some very thin paper, the grey for the same colour as the hull, and then the shop um, photocopied it down for me to 1.5 millimetre here for the side, 1.2 millimetre high for the transom. As you see, they produce it on a 
an industrial scale. So what you do, you then cut out, cut out round one of these to the full height or depth of the hull and then uh, glue it into place. So you see it there, the finished article there. So that's been cut out there to there. Apply that. You have to cut out the depth of 0.1 of a millimetre, which is the, this is the paper, 0.1 of a millimetre from the painting on the hull. Then glue the, the bit you cut out from the, um, uh, you know, the photocopied piece and then fair it in. And one, a smaller one on the stern, as you'll see a little bit later. The other thing you might be interested to know is if you see this black line along the waterline, you'll notice that it curves up a little bit. It's not completely flat and straight. And it does the same towards the after end as well. This seems a little bit peculiar to Royal Navy ships, because other ships uh, and certainly merchant ships, and I know the Soviet Navy seem to have a completely straight waterline uh, with parallel with the water. But I've not ever found that even from people who've been in the Navy as to why we have a curvature there. Um, back to 192 scale, a 13 inch long, a flower class Corvette, um, almost brand new after commissioning, um, dark grey as it would have been in 1940-1941, and uh, you can see it's got a full uh, complement of depth charges, it's obviously heavily stored up because the, uh, the black boot topping has disappeared even below the waterline here, but from a photograph I've got this, it is exactly as that. You've got um, draft marks there, the name of the ship there, and K12, the pennant number, which is done, as I showed you on the earlier, the bigger one, F113, in the same way it's cut out with a template. Now, moving on to the bow of that ship, we've got the, um, the draft marks, which are easy because they're all straight lines in Roman numerals. This height here is, is probably about an inch. I, I can't check it now. So they're all hand painted on freehand to get the, uh, the depths. And you can see that curve which I mentioned a moment ago, um, uh, where the, it raises up towards the bow. The other thing you can just see, hopefully, is the strakes, because these are riveted ships. There's the outer strake, inner, and then another outer strake here. Um, there's two ways I know of doing this. One is to try and get some very thin material and then cut it to the actual shape and length of the hull of the ship and, and glue it on. But gluing on means extra depth and thickness, and it could be uneven, so it's not really my preferred way to do it, particularly on small scales. The other way is to mask off the illustrates, and then just put in extra coats of paint on the outer strakes, and then when you remove the tape, you've got this raised outer strake um, appearance. That's the way it seems to work out for me. Uh, that's pretty much that's the one with the uh, F126 uh, I showed you earlier. Just to show you, we have also to include the helicopter deck landing indicators, PL for Plymouth. Um, these are a mixture of um, arsenal tape and freehand to get these um, items done. The other point is um, it doesn't show terribly well, but the, the, um, it is an anchor in, in a shoulder of water, but you can get ripple service of the sea. And if you get the light or sunlight, in, on that, it does look quite realistic as a um, as in calm waters. Uh, right now, before the last two items, before I move on to the next slide, I just want to talk about weathering. Um, Ships can be heavily weathered, uh, particularly on North Atlantic convoys, where they're at sea for weeks or months on end with no time for refits, and they get very rusty and corroded. Oh. So on the hulls. Hello? No? Uh, on the hulls. And, um, but I don't put weathering on mine because in peacetime, warships are usually painted up and keep, kept spick and span. That's part of the deal of their flag showing in foreign ports, and they've got to look good. And the same with the ship's boats. Um, otherwise, any small rust spots are generally very small and hardly noticeable at the scales we're working at, so I tend to omit them. Now, 
on the next slide I'll show you one where I've got accurately copied on the bow of a ship. There's the real ship on the left and there's my copy of the weathering. <clears throat> it's got a false bow wave which has obviously been eroded being at sea for several weeks and copied that there. We have the rust marks through from the hawse, hawse hole, or hawse pipe rather, rust from the uh, ship's badge and little rust streaks below each of the um, portholes. The rail ship after the battle damage, this is the Admiral Graf Spey in Montevideo in uh, 14th of December 1939. The lot of the railings are missing, probably through battle damage or blasts from the main guns. I've copied that as per photographs with missing stanchions and railings askew. Uh, uh, Finally, on the photographs further down the ship, I see this white haze, which seems to be stuck on the hull. I'm not sure what it is. It's the full length of the hull, but I suspect it's probably dried seawater, because don't forget it was summer in Southern Hemisphere in, in, um, in December, and it's probably that's what it is. Uh, it had been at sea for about three and a half months uh, during the first um, few months of the war. Uh, interestingly, the ship was always being repainted at top to disguise it, so the top works, the superstructure, probably in a very spick and spend um, condition, but when you're in the southern oceans, uh, there's hardly any, as, any time available to actually paint up the hull, so this is weathering over a period of several months, but it's the only real example I've actually done on my warships. And then finally, the last slide, that's that one I showed you in silhouette at 2400 scale. Um, it was originally thinking of ships, uh, um, shipbuilders models. Um, they probably came, same in North America, but about um, 100, 100 years ago, um, a lot of the shipbuilders, uh, at the height of the um, British sea power, they built lovely models, about eight, seven, eight feet long in glass cases for showing purposes to show off um, their works and be able to sell their, uh, their ships or their plans. So the idea was to copy that and put it in a glass case similar to you find to a builder's model. So it had to be full hull mounted on brass pedestals with its rudders, propellers, bilge keels, etc. And you can just about make out some of the aerials there. But it was a little bit delicate, so I had to make it inside another case. Uh, which you can see here, and it's a darkish wood. This is pear wood, which is nice fine grain fruit wood, and it's wax polished. In some cases you can paint them or, uh, or whatever, but this is about early 20th century, so contemporaneously the woods would be a dark, pretty dark sort of colour, dark brown colour. So I've repeated that here. On more modern ships, I tend to make uh, use maple, which is a nice light coloured wood for the cases, which again is more in keeping uh, with the popularity of woods and, and colours in uh, recent uh, decades. Anyway, that is um, four centimetres, 1.6 inches long. That, so that's the smallest scale I've been able to work at.